Hi, I'm Linda. And um, and a friend of mine moved out to Des Plaines. And I it was close to Christmas. So I wanted to see her before the holidays. And my uncle happened to live at a place called the Oasis Trailer Park. And uh, they moved just a few short blocks from there. So I was a little bit familiar with the area. But um, I went out to visit my friend, and she went she was going to a new high school. I think it was called Maine West. And she said, oh, Linda, there's this guy. He's so, oh, he's a fox, as they said in the 70s, you know. And uh, she's a nice girl, but, you know, she wasn't a cheerleader. But I said, okay. And she says, he works at this, uh, at the pharmacy over here. You know, let's go take a walk because neither of us were driving at the time. So we took a walk. It was a little bit after dinner time. uh, And it was cold, I remember. And we walked into this pharmacy. And we walked up and she says, I want you to meet my friend. Uh, I don't remember if she called him Bob or Rob, but I remember, remember the word name Peace, because I thought that was kind of close to Judas Priest in my head. I just remembered that. But uh, he was a good-looking guy, and not somebody that you would see the two of them together. And the only reason that's, that means, you know, anything to me in my memory here is because of what happened afterwards. So she introduces me to the to the guy and he was cool. I don't remember exactly the words we exchanged, but what it, what stuck out in my head was here was my friend who was, and I, you know, my friend was nice, but she's kind of gangly, very plain. And here's this good looking guy. And he was so nice to her. You know, some guys can be like, you know, blow off like, yeah, whatever, you know, this chick likes me or whatever. But he was so kind and very accommodating. And he didn't have a lot of time, but he spoke to her and said to me, nice to meet you. And um, it was a very short exchange, but he made an impact because I just thought, wow, that guy is really cool. He's, high, he's good looking, but he was so nice to my friend because he could have been a bully and he wasn't. He looked like a the captain of the football team kind of guy. Not, not big built, but just a, that kind of guy. And he uh, had to excuse himself because he had to get back to work. But he said, it was very nice meeting you. And I said, yeah, nice meeting you. And my friend turned to me and she's like, oh, my God. You see what I mean? I went, yes, I see what you mean. He's a good-looking guy. And um, and we left. And I just recall the next day, um, it's almost like a neighborhood thing where people were going door to door like they couldn't find this guy, and it was the guy that we met at the pharmacy, you know, Robert Peace, Bob Peace, Bob Peace. And I just remember my friend was crying. She was so upset. She's like ready to go and look and try to find him. And um, But it made an impact on me because, not because that he, you know, uh, eventually we found out succumbed to this whole thing. Um, I remember his kindness, that he was kind to my friend. And he, that stay with me all these years. The voice you just heard is that of a woman named Linda. 40 years after the fact, still is impacted by the death of Rob Peast. I didn't track Linda down to do an interview. She reached out to me after hearing about this podcast, and she did so because of who Rob Peast was, and it still resonates with her. She simply wanted to share a fleeting moment of her life that has stuck with her all of these years. This is a perfect example of the long-reaching, seemingly never-ending ramifications of the horrors that Gacy perpetrated not only on his victims, but on their mothers, fathers, siblings, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, friends, lovers, fellow students, co-workers, and even mere acquaintances. Their loss has been felt in numbers that are nearly impossible to quantify, but they are vast. Six of Gacy's victims still 
after all of these years have never been identified. All of these young men had people that loved and cared about them. And I am certain that someone out there knows of a boy that went missing in the Chicago area between 72 and 78, and maybe even in other cities that Gacy traveled to during the same time frame. If you are one of those people and you catch wind of this podcast, reach out to us at insider at defensediaries.com because the victims, every single one of them, deserves to be known. Sam said I could have killed 100 people. How do I know I didn't kill 100 people? How did I know I didn't do this while I was traveling? Possible, but I don't recall if I did any stalking or, or traveling. You know, you know, like if I get done with the job at night, if I, I went around looking for something or anything. Before we jump in, it's important for you, the listener, to know what resources I'm using to create this podcast. And what they are are the following. The Gacy tapes, of course, trial transcripts, the police investigation file, copies of motions that were filed by both the defense and the state, appellate briefs, and interviews with the attorneys, the police, and witnesses that were involved in the case. I am not using newspaper articles, books, or existing documentaries. I'm exclusively using direct sources, so everything that you hear will be directly from the horse's mouth. During the course of this season, you will also hear my theories as we dig in. You may agree or disagree, but either way, we would love to hear from you to create a community so that we can interact and discuss many of these theories. As I said in the last episode, this case is like an onion. There's layer after layer, and it was complicated. So make sure to like and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. As I've already heard from numerous listeners who either had close calls with Gacy or some kind of connection with this case, think of this podcast as your safe haven. Don't be shy and reach out. This is episode three of the Gacy Tapes, a pocket full of dimes. If you recall from last week, we left off on December 13th, 1978. Robbie Peast has gone missing from Nissan Pharmacy. The police have learned from three people that when he left the building that he was going to talk to a contractor about a summer job. After the police learn the name of the contractor, Detective Rafael Tovar does a little digging on Gacy. And what I did, I took the report, a copy of it, and started running name checks on all the people to see, first of all, where they lived and whatnot. And when I did that, I also ran criminal history checks on them and Gacy's name popped out right away, and I followed up and found out he'd done time in Iowa for sodomy of a child. So he pretty much became a prime candidate. This sodomy charge that Gacy was convicted of in Iowa in 1968 creates a where there is smoke, there is fire vibe with the police. And that is often the case because typically the first move for any detective looking at a potential suspect is to run their background to see what they've been up to over the years. And what they are looking for is propensity. Does this guy have a violent past? Is he a thief, a drug dealer, etc.? So when Tovar gets the ding on Gacy's background, his ears perk up big time because this guy is a potential creep. We also know that on the 13th, Gacy comes into the station to make a statement and he denies having any direct contact with Robbie. And while he's there, the Cook County Sheriff and the Des Plaines Police search his home. They don't find Robbie or any clear-cut signs that he was there. They do, however, find that stretch of nylon rope with the hairs. But remember, this is pre-DNA. So comparing hairs with a known sample only goes so far in terms of providing usable evidence. What they also find is a class ring, with the initials J-A-S engraved into it. Clearly not Robbie's ring, but a very interesting find nonetheless. And one that would spark suspicion with the police that maybe, just maybe they're dealing with more than one victim here, but more on that later. Now, when police investigate a crime, they focus on three different factors. And those are means, motive, and opportunity, all of which are typically needed in order for the state to secure a conviction at trial. So what do these terms mean? Well, the term means in this context refers to the criminal's physical ability or tools or weapons that the perpetrator has at their disposal. The easiest way to describe this is to use a hypothetical. Say a victim is shot and killed. The officers will come and secure the scene. Evidence technicians will arrive and process it and collect the evidence. 
and the body will be sent by the police for an autopsy that will be performed by a medical examiner who will determine the cause of death, which in this example is clearly a gunshot. The autopsy may additionally provide the police with the type of gun used, however, such as a handgun, a shotgun, etc., and the caliber of the bullet. If the police can determine the caliber of the weapon used and they have a suspect that they like, who happens to have the same caliber weapon that was used during the commission of the crime registered in their name, well, then the police have established means. Now, motive, it's familiar to all of us. We all know what that means. It's basically the underlying reason that the perpetrator committed the crime. The most common motives are money, jealousy, lust, revenge. In this case, where the motive is not abundantly clear, the police have a much tougher road to hoe in terms of identifying a suspect. The final factor is opportunity, which is being at or within close proximity to the scene of the crime. At this point in time, police were only looking at Gacy, and what they knew was that Gacy was potentially the last person that had seen Robbie Peast alive. So as far as the police were concerned, they could check off the opportunity box. They have nothing as far as means because they don't know if Rob Peast is dead or alive. They may have suspicions, but they don't know. Motive, well, that's not even in play yet, because while they suspect that a crime has been committed, they aren't certain. And the search of Gacy's home, at least on its face, did nothing to change that. The cops needed more, and fast, so they turned up the heat, so to speak, on Gacy. So on December 14th, three days after Rob Peast goes missing, the surveillance of Gacy begins in earnest. The five police officers charged with that task of following the creep around were the officers Hackmeister, Schultz, Robinson, Albrecht, and Sergeant Lang. No decision was made early on on whether or not this was going to be a covert surveillance or not, meaning that Gacy may or may not know whether they were sitting on him. And this was not a clear-cut choice. I mean, think about it. There was a sincere hope by everyone that Rob Peast was still alive especially in light of the fact that the search didn't produce anything that clearly indicated that he wasn't. So the thought that an open and obvious surveillance would deter Gacy from killing again was not taken into consideration at all. It couldn't have been, based on what they knew at the time. So was the hope that Gacy would slip up and lead them to Rob Peast, either dead or alive? Or was it simply that they didn't have enough manpower to conduct covert surveillance? Unfortunately, Lieutenant Kozenzak is no longer with us for me to ask him. It seems to me that there would have been a much greater likelihood that Gacy would have potentially revealed Rob Peace's location if he didn't know that he was being followed. Considering that they knew that Rob's body was not in the house because of the search two days earlier, they also knew that Gacy walked into the police station at three in the morning, covered in mud. So they must have believed that he had gotten rid of the body. They just had absolutely no clue where. It's certainly not uncommon in general for criminals to visit the scene of the crime or to try to check on the status of where they disposed of the remains. Gacy just wasn't that stupid. Gacy knew that he was an active suspect and was rushed when disposing of Rob's body. The police had to be hoping that he was going to go back to cover his tracks more thoroughly because of the fact that they were on to him. The fact that the police had been to his house the day after he had killed Rob Peast and had him come into the station and further searched his home all in two days' time clearly would have weighed heavily on Gacy's mind, but not in terms of disposing of the body more thoroughly. As we know, he had already dumped the body into the Displains River in the early morning hours of December 13th. Now, seeing as Gacy knew there was absolutely no way for him to get rid of the bodies in the house and that they had already been in the crawl space during the first search, he had to be hoping against hope that Rob Peast's body didn't float ashore somewhere along its journey down south. Because without the body, Gacy is thinking, they've got nothing on me. Cops didn't know then what we know now, so the scenario still begs the question, how? In the minds of police, how would he get to do that? Get to the body and move it if the cops are on him like stink on shit? I asked Dave Hackmeister that exact question. Actually, um, it started on the, the 13th with Shilson Robinson. Those were the only two besides the supervisor, Wally Lang, that were in the TAC unit at the time. So uh, Wally really didn't participate in the surveillance. He sent his two guys out, one in each car, and they lost him 
very early on in that day of uh, 13th. But you really need minimum four or five cars. Because of the uh, manpower situation we had initially, they just put two cars on Gacy. And that's virtually impossible to run a surveillance with two cars without the bad guy knowing he's being followed. Yeah, I gotta tell you, you know, uh, if if Schultz and Robinson were told and do a sur to do a surveillance on this, this guy Gacy, their mindset is gonna be a covert surveillance because we really didn't know anything but covert surveillance. No one's ever talked about an overt surveillance before. So if they tried initially to do a covert surveillance, I can see how and why they, they lost them early on. Now, when I came on, the direction was, don't lose them. You know, we'd like this to, you know, be a low key covert surveillance, but if that doesn't work, we don't care. Do not lose this guy. We wanna know where he's at all the time. So that was the direction I had. I don't think that was necessarily the direction that Shilson Robinson had to begin with. Well, covert, obviously, we might catch him doing something that he wouldn't normally want us to know that he's doing. But that was an impossible task with just two cars on him. Well, Gacy was a wild man behind the wheel. I mean, he drove 60, 70, 80 miles an hour through red lights through the city of Chicago. He just drove like an idiot. So all he had to do was look in the rearview mirror and see two other idiots behind him, and he knows he's being followed. So right. it, it, it just was a losing effort from the very beginning. How, how long do you think it took for him to make you guys, like, realistically? Ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. The unintended yet incredibly fortuitous result of this open and obvious tale was that it stopped Gacy from killing again. So that was a massive win just like Detective Tovar says. I mean, I think they, they were kind of hoping that maybe they'd catch him, you know, trying to do something to somebody else. But, you know, that wasn't going to happen because, I mean, he knew they were there right away. But on the other hand, we're keeping him from satisfying his itch. So at that point, the police said, fuck it. Not only are we going to follow him openly, but we are going to follow him into every single public place that he goes, which is exactly what they did. I asked detectives Mike Albrecht and Dave Hackmeister to give us a little insight about those first days of following Gacy. The first night uh, that we, when we started Gacy, and like I had mentioned, we weren't given any instruction, but kind of made a decision then. I told Dave, I said, you know, if he goes into a public place, you know, we're going to follow him. And um, so uh, nobody told us that. And one of the first places we went into, was the Moose Lodge in Des Plaines. And, um, and my dad was one of the original members of the Moose Lodge. In fact, he was member number one. And uh, by this time, my dad had passed. But my mom, who attended bar there once in a while, she happened to be sitting in the bar that time. But Gacy showed up there too for a private party, some kind of party. And we noticed right away, which happened very frequently when we went into a place, uh, People just gravitated to Casey. You know, John's here, everybody's happy, blast him on, pound him on the back, and, and he was obviously very well liked. And as the week went on, and guys like Tovar and the other investigators were doing the interviews with his contacts, his friends, or whatever, um, they started, uh, um, I think, thinking there's maybe more to this than we'd ever think of. And kind of, drifted away from Gacy a little bit. And so I I kind of feel by the time it was all over with, because um, his total demeanor changed, uh, we were about all he had left to talk to. Uh, and uh, I think we used that to our advantage. With all of Gacy's friends and associates, that if they could somehow thwart our investigation, they would. And we, we as a team decided we have to somehow separate that all out. We have to get those people out of the way. And uh, that was determined to be the investigator's job. And how they did that was they interviewed all of these people time and time and time again, whether it was at their house or at work or in between. And they were finally, over a short period of time, getting tired of being, uh, for lack of a better term, harassed by the police. So they, within a short period of time again, uh, they we noticed that they were starting to back off, which gave us the opportunity to move in and befriend Gacy. Yeah, we had to get him out of the way. It's almost like, okay, Gacy can take care of himself. 
Right, and uh, and a lot of this wasn't like put down on paper. This is our plan. Things were very fluid. They were moving real fast, and 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 that's we just went with the flow. Now remember that main West class ring that was discovered in the first search, the ones with the initials J A S. Well, those clearly aren't Robbie's initials. So in terms of solving the Peast abduction, that particular object does not seem relevant. But the question of whose initials they are and why in the hell is that ring in Gacy's house persists in the minds of law enforcement. So they decide to look into it. Well, one particular thing is we found a class ring from Maine West and he had the initials JAS. So we went back, found the, actually the juvenile division and displays had yearbooks from Maine West because they dealt with them a lot. And we looked up the year, found the ring. John A. Zick, local kid, ran his name through, found out he was missing. At this point, the question of who and what they are dealing with becomes a pressing issue. Clearly, Robbie's disappearance remains the focus of their investigation, but the new evidence that is surfacing simply cannot be ignored. So the investigation bisects, and they begin looking into the sick disappearance as well. If you recall in the last episode, when we learned of the first search of Gacy's house on December 13th and the 60 or so items which were recovered, how at that time, officers didn't know whether or not certain items had any significance. Well, that's the nature of an investigation like this. Pieces start to fall into place, sometimes by luck, sometimes by straight police work, and sometimes by both. Now, one of the items that I didn't mention earlier wasn't a piece of physical evidence at all, but in fact, it was a photograph, one of several that was taken by the officers during the search of Gacy's home. This particular photograph depicted a nondescript portable Motorola television that was in Gacy's bedroom. You may be asking yourself, what in the hell does this have to do with the disappearance of Rob Peast? And the answer is, not a damn thing. But the missing kid, John Zick, well, that's a different story. So when John Zick went missing, so did his vehicle, which we will get into in much greater detail in later episodes. But contained in the trunk of Zick's vehicle was a small Motorola TV that appeared very similar to the one that was depicted in the one particular photograph taken during the search. Now these pictures that were taken of various items in the house that did not appear to have any relation to Rob Peace's abduction will become an issue because if you recall, warrants must specify what is being searched for. It's not a free-for-all. But that is an issue that will be dealt with down the road by the trial attorneys. Right now, the detectives are using everything they have at their disposal to catch who they believe at this point is a killer. I think that I had met the at Chicago and in Clark Street or something like that. Mm-hmm. Just cruising around. I would pull up at the light. He nodded to me. I nodded back to him. I pull over to the side. He got in the car. He was looking for money. He was interested in getting into having some fun. Very simple. The next morning, Roxy and I drove down to my car to and looked for the Plymouth White Plymouth satellite with the banged up front fender, which was parked on Clark Street across from the Newberry Theater. We went down there, he drove uh, that car, and I drove mine, and we drove back to, to my house. We, he opened up the trunk, he cleaned out the trunk, and he wanted the car, and I said, well, hell, I said, what do I get for it? He said, I'll tell you what, I said, I'll give you the car for 300 He said, he didn't have the money, and I said, well, we'll work it out another way. He drove the car back to my house, I drove my car back. He said, you know, you're gonna, we're going to have to get rid of everything that was in the car. Yeah, he said, leave it to me. I'll get rid of everything in the car. Then he, I, I think the title was in the car. Also some plates, and I told him it wasn't a, a, a wise idea. He found license plates in the trunk. There was a television in the trunk, license plates in the trunk, jewelry, women's clothing, wigs. There was, there was stuff in the trunk. I went in the house, and I believe I put the body down in the trunk. Detective Tovar, after learning that John Zick had been missing for about a year, pays a visit to the young man's mother, as he wants to show her pictures of other evidence that had been photographed during the search, namely a shirt and a watch. Tovar wants to know if Sick's mother can positively identify either of those items as belonging to her son. 
Unfortunately, Mrs. Zick informs Tovar, no, those are not my son's property. Tovar, obviously disappointed, seemingly hits a dead end. Or has he? Because before Tovar leaves Mrs. Zick's home, she gives him a brown lunch bag filled with various papers. Tovar takes the bag from her and leaves. The television, we, the, we went for the first search warrant, we took, well, the county did, they were, because it's in their territory, they took photographs of the entire house. And I remember seeing a TV that kind of resembled what she described, had a kind of handle on it, she was a Motorola, but she had no paperwork on it. So then I uh, said, well, we'll go talk to Motorola. Went to Motorola, they don't make those TVs anymore. They don't make TVs at that time. And there was a little old guy there, a janitor, actually, which is an interesting side story here. He kind of like asked us what we wanted, you know, and we were telling him that we're looking for a particular TV. He says, you know what? He says, I collect every brochure of every TV we ever made. And he, he said, let me look and I'll try to find it. Because we did have the model, I'm sorry, we did have the model number. Well, lo and behold, a couple of days later, comes in with a little brochure. And the freaky thing about it was, you know how TVs always have a simulated picture in it? Mm -hmm. The simulated picture in this TV was a clown. <laughs> I was like, I said, whoa, <laughs> this is really weird. I know I keep hammering home the fact that this is all going down in 1978, but that's because it's such an important fact for you to remember. Because essentially what was going on with this team of officers that are investigating this case is that they are in a situation wherein the left hand does not necessarily know what the right hand is doing. Information trickles in between the members of the team as the officers on the tail basically have no clue what the officers in the field are discovering or not discovering, and vice versa. I didn't really realize it until the next day when I'm being relieved how dangerous it is because I have no communication at all with anybody. I'll, you know, once I leave the planes, I have no radio communication. Uh, and then I'm, I'm now picking up little bits and pieces about, hey, you know, our victim might have been killed, plus there might be a few others involved. You know, so I'm thinking, that's not good for one guy to sit out here with no communication. So that very next day, I said, listen, I think I, I really need a partner out here. I'm on a midnight shift. We worked midnight to noon, and the other shift worked noon to midnight. So... Uh, I knew Mike, I knew Mike was working on the desk and I uh, asked Mike, hey, if, if they're looking for somebody, would you mind volunteering for the position? And Mike said, yeah, I'd be happy to. So Mike jumped in and he became my partner for the Gacy case. Us as a surveillance team, we'd only pick that up, that information up when we were being debriefed. That happens when we're leaving. So we're, we're relieved by the other team. Uh, Wally drives us back to the PD. We get a very quick debriefing on what happened with the investigators. We kind of tell them what we saw with Gacy, and then they wanted us to go home right away, catch some sleep. Plus, no. everything we did, everything we observed, we had to write down. You know, we were talking into a tape recorder, you know, so as soon as we got somewhere, we had a, a, a minute or two, we had to write down exactly where we went, you know, what route we took, what was going on there. And we, we were also writing down you know, things that Gacy said, it's pretty tedious. Now, in light of what Hackmeister just said, I want you to try and imagine how much more difficult this makes things for the investigation teams. It makes what they ultimately were able to accomplish all that more impressive. So while Tovar is sniffing out the television lead, the surveilling team is following Gacy's every move. As Gacy now knows they are on him, an incredibly strange thing occurs. Gacy befriends his pursuers. Then Gacy left by himself, and as he goes by, he says, hey, I'm gonna grab a bite to eat. Is there any place close by that uh, you guys know of? And, uh, there just happened to be a restaurant called The Pot and Pan, not too far away, that's a 24-hour restaurant. We mentioned that to him. So he went over there, and we, after he went in, we followed him in, sat a couple tables away, and Gacy finally just looks at us and says, hey, as long as you're gonna be in here, why don't you just sit with me? So we went over and said, hey, that's what you want. That's good with us. And then we just started all kinds of different conversations. It started out with, I don't know, what, what are you guys following me for? Am I, am I uh, 
being looked at for some drug transactions or is it about this kid that's supposedly missing and we were very concerned about how we how are we standing legally with this whole thing you know uh, are we infringing on his rights uh, although he's inviting us in you know that's the thing in a, you know plus for us so we just went went with the flow you know just tried to let our instincts go with it and uh, they talked about everything. He talked about being a registered clown and how he likes to help these young kids who are hospitalized. And since he's a registered clown, he could go there and entertain these poor kids. And uh, he talked about his business and how successful he was. And we were beginning to realize that he was, you know, pretty much of a braggart. He loved to talk about himself, you know. And uh, so we kind of played on that a little bit. You know, we asked him how he became so successful and he would talk about, uh, he even talked about when he would go into a drugstore how he would um, talk to the pharmacists about how to face different products he says you don't want to put anything that that is a hot seller on the bottom shelves you want to get them at eye level so he's consulting all these pharmacists on how to uh, push their products you know so uh, he was very very impressed with himself and Asked, also asked us about uh, Rob Peace. He said, hey, I'm, cons I'm really concerned about this kid. You know, I, I, I like young kids. You know, if there's anything I can do, anything to help, uh, if you want me to help search for him, get on a search team, I'll do anything. But I got to tell you, I don't know anything about the kid. You know, but we're trying to get him to say something that would lead us in a particular direction. And he's trying to get, inf we could tell, he's trying to get information from us as to what we know. You know, so we're feeding him a bunch of crap and he's feeding us a bunch of crap, what it amounts to, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I think we both realized it. Matter of fact, at one point, when he talked about being covered in mud, he, we were talking about vacation spots. And he says, I got this place up in Spooner, Wisconsin. And he says, this is the best place ever. If you ever want to get away, it's so, desolate out there nobody even knows you're there he says but the place i stay at has got this real long driveway and every time i go in that driveway i get stuck in the mud and mike and i are like okay we know where the body's at you know we know exactly where the body's at now back then we couldn't you know text and tell our boss where it is what we did we had a handful or a pocket full of dimes and as soon as we were free we'd go to a payphone dial up our boss and tell him, hey, you got to get to Spooner, Wisconsin, get a helicopter up there and start looking for some unearthed ground. This bizarre relationship that develops between the hunters and the hunted as they both probe and search for answers from one another would ultimately lead to a final showdown in the days to come that will reveal answers that neither was prepared for or wanted to hear. Following up on the developing case regarding the disappearance of John Zick, Detective Tovar heads into Chicago to talk to the officer who took the missing persons report back in January of 1977. Tovar sits down and starts asking some questions of the officer. He inquires about the vehicle that was registered in John Zick's name. Tovar probes on. He further learns that at some point in December of 77 that someone had stolen gas from a service station and that one of the attendants working at the station caught the plate of the vehicle as it sped away. Chicago police were able to track that vehicle. However, when they locate the registration, they discover that the Plymouth satellite was no longer registered to John Zick, but in fact was registered to a man named Michael Rossi. And the date of the title of the transfer is after the date that Zick is reported missing. The CPD track down Rossi and bring him in for questioning regarding the theft of the gas. Rossi shows up and they ask him about stealing the gas. He cops to it. The officer then asks him how he came to own a vehicle that belonged to a man that had been reported missing. Rossi looks at the cop and he tells him that he bought the car off of his boss. And he's not sure how his boss came into owning the car, but that if he wants to call him or go over to his place and ask him, he's sure that he can explain the whole thing to him. All he knows is he paid 300 bucks for the car and he is the legitimate owner. The cop says, fair enough. What's the guy's address? The guy who sold you the car. Rossi pauses and then answers, oh, my boss? Uh, his name is John Gacy, and this is his address. Rossi is allowed to leave the station. Immediately after Rossi leaves, 
the cop jumps into his car and drives over to Gacy's house. He then knocks on the door. Gacy answers. The cop tells him that his employee, Mike Rossi, had just been picked up for theft and that they had tracked him down by the license plates and that Rossi had just told him that he had bought the vehicle in question from him. Gacy says, oh yeah, so? The cop pauses and says, well, that particular vehicle was owned by a young man named John Zick. Oh, oh yeah, Gacy says. Yeah, he approached me one day on the job uh, and asked me if I had any interest in buying his car because he was going to be moving out to California. So I helped the kid out. Even though I didn't need the car, Rossi was desperate for a car, so I sold it to him for 300 bucks. The cop thought that this conversation left a lot to be desired, so he decides to follow up on Gacy's story. So he locates the address for Zick's parents and drives over to speak with them. The officer first asks Mrs. Zick when she last heard from her son. She begins crying immediately. She was so relieved and thankful that the police were finally following up on her son's case. She goes on to explain that she has not seen nor heard from her son since January of 77. The officer explains to her that she can relax because her son is fine. He's just moved to California back in early January. Nothing nefarious has occurred. This man named Gacy just verified that he bought your son's car. So, you know, John had the money to move out west. He proceeds to show her the vehicle registration. The officer, fully expecting Mrs. Sick to be relieved at hearing this good news, was shocked when she once again breaks into tears. The officer says, ma'am, what is it? Unable to fully catch her breath, she explains to the officer that Johnny had just signed a lease on a new apartment a couple of months prior to his disappearance and that his girlfriend was going to be moving in with him. He was excited about it and he would never have moved to California without telling her. He had never gone more than a couple of days without calling her, at least to say hi, until he disappeared. The officer felt a pit forming in his stomach. And his car, she says, was his most prized possession. He never would have sold it. She asked to see the registration. The cop hands it over to her. She looks at it and asks him to wait here for a minute and retreats back into the house. She returns several minutes later and shows the officer a sheet of paper bearing the signature of John A. Zick. She points at the sheet of paper and holds up the registration next to it. This signature on the title looks nothing like my Johnny's signature, nothing. The cop looks down at both signatures, and while he is no handwriting expert, it is clear that John Zick had not signed the title of the vehicle over to Mike Rossi. My God, the cop thought to himself. He tells Mrs. Zick that she's been very helpful and that he'll be in touch with her. He jumps into his cruiser and speeds back to the station. He bursts into his lieutenant's office, declaring that he's just solved a missing persons case. His lieutenant hears him out, and he instructs him to start drafting a complaint for search warrant for this guy Gacy's house, because this definitely amounts to probable cause for a warrant. The officer prepares the complaint for warrant and is in front of a judge within three hours. The judge looks at the complaint and determines that there is, in fact, probable cause for the warrant and issues it then and there. The Chicago police in December of 1977 effectuate the warrant on Gacy's home and during the search, discover a main West class ring, bearing the initials J-A-S, John Six initials. The officer immediately calls Mrs. Sick to inquire as to whether her son attended Main West. Yes, yes he did. Well, did he own a class ring with his initials engraved into it? Yes, he did. What's John's middle name? Alan, she says. I still have the receipt somewhere for the ring. The cop hangs up the phone, with his hands visibly shaking. Armed with this information, the Chicago police secure an arrest warrant for John Wayne Gacy. Are you thinking, wait, what the fuck? This guy's been talking about this class ring with those initials for the last two episodes being found in December of 1978. Yeah, there's no need to rewind that story uh, that you've just heard to double check that you heard it right, because you did. And what you heard just now was a work of fiction that is unequivocally what should have happened. What actually happened is that after Gacy gave the cop and Zick moving to California story, they chose not to follow up at all, ever. As a result, Robert Edward Gilroy, age 18, was killed September 15th, 1977 by John Wayne Gacy. John Anthony Mowry, age 19, was killed by John Wayne Gacy, September 25th, 1977. Russell Lloyd Nelson, age 21, was killed by John Wayne Gacy, October 17, 1977. Robert David Winch, age 16, was killed by John Wayne Gacy, November 10, 
1977. Tommy Joe Bowling was 20 years old, killed by John Wayne Gacy, November 18, 1977. David Paul Talsma, 19, killed by John Wayne Gacy, December 9, 1977. William Wayne Kindred, age 19, killed by John Wayne Gacy, February 16, 1978. Timothy David O'Rourke, age 20, killed by John Wayne Gacy, between June 16 and the 23rd of 1978. Frank William Landigan, age 19, killed by John Wayne Gacy, November 4, 1978. James Mazzara, age 20, killed by John Wayne Gacy, November 24, 1978. And Robert Jerome Peast, killed by John Wayne Gacy, December 11, 1978. All these young men lost their lives at the hands of this monster, and it shouldn't have been. But what seems to be a running theme that I've heard repeatedly in my interviews with law enforcement was that kids that went missing during the 70s were by default thought to be runaways, not victims, which was a bleed over from the mid to late 60s in the era of free love, anti-war protest, and anti-establishment sentiments that were being espoused by the youth at that time. While the pushback from the establishment was in large part to view these thousands of kids that went missing in the 70s, just as hippies being hippies. But this response by the government came at a very steep price. And it wasn't just the loss of Gacy's victims. It was the loss of American innocence as everything related to the safety of our children changed on that cold December day when the first bones were discovered in Gacy's crawl space. I'd like to thank detectives Mike Albrecht, Raphael Tovar, and Dave Hackmeister, and Linda for taking time out of their busy schedules to give us the insights that they gave us during this episode. I'd like to give some credit where credit is due, as simply put, without the hard work of these people, this podcast would not exist. My sorcerer of sound, executive producer Darren Wood, producer Marty Fairley, the maestro of music Taras Horoluski and Ryan Gack, who mixes and masters all of Taras's beautiful haunting music, Alex Carver, who created all the amazing art, and Allison Mata, who makes all of the things that need to happen to make sure this podcast is accessible to you, and finally to you, the listeners, who without your support, I would just be some guy talking to himself about a 40-year-old case. So thank you all from the bottom of my heart. So be sure to join us for the next episode of Defense Diaries when police recover a seemingly innocuous receipt that would end up causing Gacy's house of cards to come tumbling down. Say cheese. And finally, if you're enjoying what you hear and are gaining anything from it, I can't tell you how important it is for you to spread the word by subscribing, sharing, rating, and reviewing the show. And maybe bigger than all of those things is mentioning it when someone asks for a recommendation for a new podcast. That's how we grow and reach new people. Thanks. This podcast is sponsored by Podbean. Podbean is the easiest way to create your own podcast. We use Podbean to host Defense Diaries. Download the free Podbean podcast app to start, record, and publish your very own podcast in minutes. Podbean provides everything you need to run your podcast. and You can record and publish episodes directly from the app on your phone. Download the free Podbean app today. That's P-O-D. Okay, we know where the body's at. We know exactly where the body's at.